We're so glad you're here today. Well, today I began a brand new series entitled um, The Power to Change. The Power to Change. Now, I want you to understand something. Uh, new Year's here, and for all of us, we, uh, we think about change around this time of the year, don't we? We think about how we get better, but lasting change can be difficult, can't it? I mean, how many of you, don't raise your hand, because I know that most everybody would raise your hand. How many of you would say, there's been a point in my life that I made a decision that I was going to eat better, go on a diet, lose weight, that was a resolution, and you kept it for 24 hours or so, all right? So, so, you know, lasting change can be difficult. But over the next six weeks, we're going to learn what the Bible says about permanent, positive change. Do you know the Bible tells us that when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, that you become a new creation. The oldest past, the new has come. The Bible calls it salvation it uses terms like being born again. That gives the idea of a brand new birth, new beginning, complete change. And so the Bible talks about this a lot. Well, today I want to talk to you about the first of these messages. Uh, the title of my message today is The Key to Lasting Change. What do you do? It's probably different than what you think because most people think that what you got to do, you got to watch some guy like Tony Robbins or somebody like that that tells you what to do, what to buy, there's always something to buy, right? You want to get changed, you want to get better, you got to buy their program, their book, their whatever. And uh, they'll tell you that what you need is to believe in yourself or to have more determination or to set better goals. Or, I mean, we could go on. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Now, don't get me wrong, the Bible's not against determination or goals or any of that, okay? But there is a key to change that will help you become what the Bible calls you, which is a new creation in Christ, okay? And that's all what we want. We want to be better. No matter who you are, no matter how long you've been a Christian, we want to get better. We want life to be better. We want to make better decisions, we want uh, our families to be better. We want to be blessed. I mean, so you want that. Everybody wants that, right? So the Bible talks about how to do that. And we're not talking about change like diets or exercise. Now, eating healthy is good. Exercise is good. We're not talking about making a resolution not to cuss in Atlanta traffic, okay? That may be one that's hard to keep, all right? We're not talking about any of that, even reading the Bible or praying more. When we make these decisions, and, and look, I, I know that so many Christians have done this. This year, I'm going to read the Bible. This year, I'm going to pray more. And should you read the Bible and should you pray? Absolutely. But I'm going to tell you the key. Today, the key is not being more determined. It's not having better goals. There is a key, and we're going to talk about it today. Now, if anybody knew the frustration of performance-based Christianity, it was the Apostle Peter. And this is really what we're talking about, because you, for so long, have been living your life and looked at your relationship with Jesus Christ based on your performance. I know, because we all are tempted to do this. Performance-based Christianity, whereas it might make for certain denominations to be good. It might make you feel better about yourself. It might allow you to, like, you know, go do protests against certain groups or certain sins or to boycott certain companies, okay? Maybe that's good for that. But performance-based Christianity is not good for your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I want you to understand something. Even though I live this way for much of my life, Performance-based Christianity only, listen, only will lead you to frustration, to failure, to a warped view of who God is, 
And let me just tell you something. We all, we're tempted with that. We have something challenging happen to us, and all of a sudden we think God doesn't love us anymore. God is not in control. God's angry with us, right? We've all been there. But the apostle Peter knew what this was like. And if you have read the Gospels, you know that Peter was, I love this guy. He was, he's like, I'm going to act and then I'm going to think. And sometimes I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth. And that's who he was. He was, he was a guy that wore his emotions on his sleeve. He even said he would die for Jesus. And just a few hours later, he denied him three times. Didn't just deny him, but he cursed God. Now, I would say that there are a lot of Christians that never got that far. Cursed God. And then he quit. He quit on God. He told his disciples, I'm talking about the people that walked with Jesus three and a half years on this earth. You know what he said to them? I'm going fishing. What he was saying was not that there's anything wrong with going fishing. He said, I'm going back to my lifestyle. I'm going back to the old way of doing things. I'm going back to the old life. And he did. And I know that there are some of you that have done that or you've been tempted to do that. You've been saved. The power of God has been demonstrated in your life. And yet what has happened is you've been tempted to go back to the old way of doing things. You've been tempted to quit. You've been tempted to give up. You've been tempted to throw in the towel. You've been tempted to... I, I talked to somebody about this this week. You've been tempted to try to do the Christian life on your own. And I have a, a warning for you. you can't possible. You cannot live the Christian life in isolation. You cannot live the Christian life alone. You may think you can. You may think that, well, I can do just as good out here on my own. And I'm not suggesting you should never have any alone time. I'm saying that the Christian life was meant to be lived with other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Now, you may think that, well, I don't need that. I don't need the church. I don't need all that. I got me a internet connection. I'm listening to my favorite podcast, uh, favorite music or whatever. And the truth is, folks, you can't do it alone. Yes. Okay. Uh, somebody grab me a mic. I can hold the mic. So now they told me last week I held the mic down around the bottom and it messed it up. So I'm going to hold it up top. All right. Everybody got it? Okay. Very good. How many can hear me now? All right. Good. Well, Peter, he had a problem because he tried to uh, do this performance-based kind of Christianity that you and I are so tempted to do. Now, when he figured out the key that I'm going to talk to you about today, then what happened was there was radical change, okay? Complete radical change. In fact, changed so much that uh, Peter turned everything around. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't give up on Peter just because he messed up a little bit? Well, I'm glad he hasn't given up on me. Well, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 men, not including women and children, were saved and baptized. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. God used him to take the gospel, beginning of this, to the Gentiles. The apostle Paul did a lot of it, but Peter did as well. He paved the way. And so Peter became one of these people that discovered the secret. He began to understand there was more to the Christian life than just checking the boxes. I went to church. I didn't smoke, dip, or chew or run with girls that do. I mean, you know, we, we come up with all kinds of lists, and he quit being a list-keeping Christian. Now, I don't know about you, but I like lists. I like to keep a list of things and check off. I like checking off. Somehow or another, that makes me feel like I accomplished something. But when it comes to your Christian life, that's not how you live it. It's not a checklist, okay? But we're going to show you what the Bible says, that God really offers a changed life. Permanent, positive, lasting change. And I'm going to show you how the Bible tells us to get it. Second Peter chapter 1, we, we talked about the Apostle Peter. He wrote this. Here's what he said. Simon Peter, 2 Peter 1, verse 1, 
Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let me stop and ask you a question. Have you received Christ? Have you become a follower of Jesus? Have you received the Lord Jesus as your Savior? If you have, you've got what he's talking about. So he's talking to you. He qualifies you. He says, those that have received this precious faith. Then he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, I love that. God wants to multiply. Now, his grace is amazing. You don't do anything to earn it. It is freely given. But God doesn't just say, get some grace. He says, I'm going to multiply that grace to you. Not just that, but grace and peace. You need the peace of God. You need the peace that passes all understanding. That word that, as Peter would have understood it, it comes from the Hebrew word shalom, which means a total, complete kind of peace. It's not just peace of mind. It's peace with God. It's peace in your health. It's peace in your finances, peace in your family. It's a holistic kind of peace. And so here's what he's saying. Be multiplied to you a kind of life. Now, is he suggesting that you'll never have any problems? No. But if you've got the peace of God, then he's saying that this is going to be a blessing in your life. So he said, it's multiplied to you. And for those of you who are real sharp, you're going to pick up on what I'm going to talk about today in this next phrase. How is it multiplied to us? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Put a pen in that. Remember that, okay? His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, I went to Bible college and seminary, and I took Greek and Hebrew and all this stuff. Let me tell you what this word, all, in the Greek language means. Aren't you glad you came to church to learn some Greek today? It means all. Now, that's not complicated, is it? Now, we all know what the word all means. It means all. He gives us this power for all things that pertain, now notice what he defines it as, that pertain to life and godliness. Now, you know what you need? You need life. You know what life is? It's living, waking up every day, having a family, having a job, living the kind of life that God blesses. It's going about going to church and serving God and managing your finances and dealing with your kids, life. So he says, you can be blessed in your life, but not just that, and godliness. When you get saved, what happens? God wants to change you. He wants you to get better. He wants to sanctify you. That just simply means to become more like Jesus. He wants you, and by the way, you want this same thing. You become a follower of Jesus Christ. You ever just have this thing in your conscience that says, I should have done better. I shouldn't have lost my temper. I shouldn't have thought that thought. I shouldn't have said that. You see, you have a desire because you have a new man, a new nature that is in you. When you get saved, yeah, you still got the old nature. That's why you struggle sometimes. But he says he's put this new nature in you that pertains to godliness. So when you get saved, you've got that in you. It's kind of like the old saying that, you know, you got two dogs in you, a good one and a bad one, and whichever one wins is the one you feed. And, and that's true. So he's talking about that not only will you have this divine power for living life, the, the practical things of life, but also godliness, life change, right decisions, knowing what to do and what not to do, knowing how to navigate through temptation. He's saying that he's going to give you this divine power, not your power, but the power of God. Now, when you understand this, it's quite spectacular. 
God gives me this divine power for godliness, for living for him, and for living a good, normal, wisdom-filled life. And then once again, he says something again. Some of you who are sharp are going to pick this up. You're going to know what the theme of this message is. He says, how do you get this divine power? How do you get this power for godliness, this power for living? He says, through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence, by which he has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Exceedingly great. God's given you this power. He has given you these exceedingly great promises so that, now here's the key, so that these things, in these things, you might become, there's this change, the partakers of the divine nature, and what happens? You'll escape the corruption that is in this world through lust. How many would like to escape the corruption of this world? You just turn on the TV and does anybody here think that when it comes to politics, I just get angry. I don't talk about politics here, but sometimes I think that we have a choice not between the lesser of two evils, but the evil of two lessers, you know. (laughs) This world is corrupt. And God says there is a way for you to deal with it. Even in this political environment, even in this environment with social media and all of the nonsense that goes on in the world, he says there is a key to living this kind of life. Now, the central thought here, the central action step is getting to know Jesus. That's what he says. The central step is to get to know Jesus. Now, there are a lot of people that know about Jesus are you with me? You know, you believe in him. I heard one preacher say it this way. He said, you believe in Jesus, but you're a Christian atheist. What is a Christian atheist? Oh, they believe in God. They just live like he doesn't exist. And so what the challenge here is for us as believers is not to set more goals I'm not against goal setting and neither is God. It's not more determination. I'm not against determination and neither is the word of God. God nowhere tells you not to be determined. But the key to all of it is not keeping a list, not being what a denomination says you should be, not winning Christian of the year, okay? You know what it is? It's getting to know Jesus, not facts about him, to, but to get him, get to know him personally. Now, let me just illustrate this. I know a lot of facts about Michael Jordan. For those of you who know me, I grew up in North Carolina. I am a North Carolina Tar Heel fan. You're welcome. God bless you. All right, so I grew up there. I'm a Tar Heel. Uh, I used to say that I was Tar Heel born, Tar Heel bred. And when I die, I'll be Tar Heel dead, all right? So I grew up as a fan of University of North Carolina Tar Heels. Now, for those of you who know your history, (laughs) that was supposed to be a joke, all right, because, you know, you may not know when the Declaration of Independence was signed, but you know that Michael Jordan went to the University of North Carolina, right? So you know that Michael Jordan went to the University of North Carolina, and I can tell you, I know lots of facts about Michael Jordan. I do. I know, in my opinion, he was the greatest NBA player ever. I know he he didn't graduate. He only played three years at the University of North Carolina, entered the draft, was the number three draft pick. Can you imagine picking two people before Michael Jordan, of all people? But let let me say this. I know a lot of facts about him. But I've never met the man. So you could say, I don't know Michael Jordan. Now, I know who he is, but I don't know him. On the other hand, in May of 1982, I pulled up into the parking lot of the college where Kim and I went to college 
And I saw this little blonde-headed woman. She was 18 years old. And I decided that I liked what I saw. Me likey, me likey a lot. <laughs> and my initial, um, I guess, uh, what do you call the, like an opening statement? You know, your pickup line. All right, you know what my pickup line was? You, you, you don't, you don't want to miss this. For those of you single, listen, you can learn. You can learn. Here's what I said to this 18-year-old beautiful blonde-headed woman. I said to her, you sure do have small wrists. <laughs> now you laugh. Is that a horrible pickup line? Absolutely, okay? But I've been married to her for 37 years, so it must have worked. Okay, now listen. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. I know about Michael Jordan, but I know Kim Miller. You know why? Because I've been in a relationship with her for 41 years. We've been married 37. We started dating. Actually, this will be the 42nd year. We started dating in May of 1982. We've been together ever since. Now, what is the difference? I know about Michael Jordan. I can quote you lots of facts. I can say things to you that are true. But I don't know him personally. But I know Kim Miller in a way that is different. So what the Bible shows us is the key to be partakers in this divine nature is that we are to get to know Jesus personally. And I want you to understand something, because some of you have already set in your mind, what I got to do this year is I got to quit, and you fill in the blank. I got to quit lying. I got to start telling the truth. Should you do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I got to quit looking at certain things that I know I shouldn't be looking at. Should you do that? Absolutely. I, I got to quit losing my temper. I got to quit. And you can fill in the blank. doesn't matter what it is. And you think that because of your performance that Jesus is going to be pleased with you. But I'm going to show you what the Bible says, that that is not the key because when I focus on what I do, then the outcome of my relationships depends on me. And I got some bad news for you. Now, I know you say, well, I didn't come to church to be offended, Pastor. Well, where else do you go? All right, this is a good place as any, right? You can be offended here, right? And let me say this. If you base your relationship with Jesus Christ based on your performance, you, you're going to fail. You're going to be upset. You're not going to make it. And, and, and let me tell you, the key to change, and by the way, God's not saying don't change these things in your life. He does want you to change. But he wants it to be permanent and positive. Why? Because of Jesus, not because of your work. Now, I got four points. I got 10 minutes, all right? So I'm gonna do it quickly. Number one, you wanna make this permanent positive change. You wanna get to know Jesus better. Number one, you gotta commit. Listen, commit. Everybody say the word commit, commit. You gotta commit to know Jesus. Um, Paul, or Peter rather, called himself a servant of Jesus Christ. That word, and it doesn't say this in the uh, version that we read today. But the word is actually the word bond servant. You say, what's a bond servant? Well, it's a person that chooses to serve their master. They love him and they choose to live their life for the rest of their life for him and with him. That's what Peter said. I'm attaching myself to Jesus. That's what he said. I'm becoming that person. You see, we would say it in our modern language, this is a totally committed person or a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And let me just tell you, bond servants, you know what they were about? They were completely and totally about the will 
the purpose and the agenda of their master. Didn't have their own agenda. They submitted to his will. They said, I'm going to live for your purpose. Now, in the Bible, there were many people, many people, that this word was used to describe them. Abraham was one of them. Did you know Abraham wasn't perfect? In fact, he screwed up a lot. I just read the book of Genesis the past few days, a few days ago. And um, you know that Abraham, not once, but twice, twice, lied about his wife. He said, she's my sister. Well, first of all, a little weird, okay? So, um, but you know why he lied? He was trying to save his own skin. Now, that's the man of faith, the man of God, the man that God says, this was a man that believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. He's the one that God uplifts and holds as an example for all of us in our faith. That guy? Yeah. He, you know why? He became a bond servant of Jesus, of, of God. You know what he determined? He was totally committed. And he got to know the Father. And boy, I could talk about a lot of people. Um, Abraham was that way. Isaac was that way. Jacob was that way. Moses was that way. And some of you are like, you know what? I've just been too long. I've gone too far it's too late for me. I can't really make a difference. Let, let me tell you a little bit about Moses. First of all, you know the story that, um, you know, Pharaoh said, we're going to kill all the little Jewish boys. And uh, his parents put him in a little basket. Pharaoh's daughter found him. Remember the story? And he was raised where? In Pharaoh's palace. He was educated in Pharaoh's schools. He lived with Pharaoh's resources. He had the money of the royal family. In other words, he grew up privileged, okay? And when he's 40 years old, you know what happened? He murdered a guy. <laughs> Not normally the top thing you would put on your resume if you're looking for a spiritual or a church position, okay? Okay? By the way, I graduated from Bible college. I went to five years of seminary, and I murdered a guy, all right? That's not normally what you do if you're going to be the leader. Moses did. And as a result, you know what he did? For 40 years, he lived on the backside of the desert. He didn't do anything. He ran from his destiny. And God showed up one time in a burning bush and said, Moses... Here's what you're going to do. And do you know when Moses really began to make a difference, when he really began to serve God, when he really began to be involved? You know when it was? When he was 80 years old. Now, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, okay? How many of you are 80 or older? Anybody? 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 Okay. Okay. All right, right over here. All right. Let me tell you something. It's not too late. Listen. It's not too late for you. You say, well, I haven't served God. I've wasted my years. I, I haven't been involved in church. I quit on God. It's not too late, thank God, as long as you are committed to Jesus. Because you know what happened to Moses? After he murdered a guy, after he failed, after he missed his destiny, after he blew it, he became one of the greatest leader in the history of the world. Why? Because he committed to the Lord. It's not too late for you. Um, we could talk about David. We could talk about the Apostle Paul. We could talk about Peter, and we are. So uh, that's the first thing. You've got to commit to know Jesus. The second thing is this. You must commit to the person of Jesus through faith. Now, the reason this point is so long is the through faith part is very important. You got to get to know about Jesus. You got to commit to know him, but you got to commit to the person of Jesus. So how do you get to know Jesus? Well, the same as with anything else. Spend time with him. You begin to read the Bible and pray. And by the way, 
not for the purpose of, I got to quit thinking about this one thing. Or for the purpose of, I got to stop lying. Or I got to quit lusting. So I, It doesn't matter. The point is this. You don't read the Bible because you're wanting to quit something. Or you're wanting to start something. You know why you read the Bible? To get to know Jesus. That is why. You see, the truth of the matter is what you and I must understand is that we've got to commit to the person of Jesus through faith, through faith. Now, you and I must learn that um, what we do is about getting to know Jesus. And, and I, I was about to say something that was out of order, and I realized I skipped a page of notes, all right? So, but I promise you it won't be long. Let, let me just say this. Many Christians are frustrated because they focus on their performance rather than the person of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing wrong with wanting change, but real lasting change can only come through knowing Jesus, okay? Now, no matter what it is, if I focus on the bad behavior I want to correct, then my focus is misplaced. I should not be focusing on the behavior, but on Jesus, okay? That's the way you change. That's the way you get better. And I could go through this whole list of things that um, conquering my temper, loving the people who mistreat me, overcoming lust, telling the truth, not being filled with pride, sharing my faith, reading the Bible, praying more effectively, being selfless and serving the body of Christ, attending church, worshiping God, being more generous, trusting God with my finances, not gossiping, being kind. Oh, we could go on. But that's not what you focus on. What you focus on is getting to know Jesus. Think of it this way. If you have children, you want a relationship with them, right? You don't build your relationship with your children based on what they do, but who they are. The same is true with Jesus, okay? You don't build your relationship based on what you do. He doesn't look at you that way. He looks at you on, as, on the basis of who you are. Let me just illustrate it this way. My wife, Kim, she deals with the kids and she loves it. Uh, she does a great job with it. But Kim is, for many of you who do not know this, is a gifted musician. She began taking piano lessons when she was in elementary school. She became quite good. She played for her church. She played for two different professional singing groups. She was a pro. Um, she uh, was the lead pianist for our college for three different mega churches. She was the lead, lead one, okay? Uh, she won the talent portion for Florida Miss Teen when she was in high school. She majored in piano pedagogy in college. She was the leader of, of the music guild in Florida and in Georgia. She's taught piano professionally since she was 18 years old. In other words... She good. You say, you bragging on her? Yeah. But I think that every church that we've ever worked at, they really wanted Kim and they just put up with me, all right? So when I got hired, it's like, oh, your wife is Kim? You're hired, all right? So, but the truth is, if Kim's relationship with our family was based on her performance, it might go something like this. Play the piano. Every time we get together, sing, make some music. You missed the note, play better. I don't like that song. Now, how many of you think that she would put up with that for very long? You know why? She wouldn't like it. In fact, her entire relationship with the people in her family would sour. Why? Because it was performance-based. Do you wonder why so many people get mad at church so easily? Part of my job is just to respond positively when people get mad at me. Kind of a hard job, to be honest with you. And the truth is, you're never going to make everybody happy. But do you know why there are so many unhappy Christians? And then that, uh, that's almost an oxymoron, isn't it? 
I mean, the fact is, if you're a Christian, you should be filled with joy and love. But there are a lot of hateful, mean Christians. Um, the reason I really do believe is because so many Christians base everything in their relationship with God on their performance, not on knowing Jesus. They're focused on doing for him rather than knowing him. Well, let me just finish it up. You got to trust the power of Jesus for the process of change. Let me let you know this. When you begin to start saying, I'm going to get to know Jesus, it takes time. And it's a process. You know, I've got a biblical word that supports that. It's the word sanctification. You know what sanctification means? It means really becoming more like Jesus. But do you know how you do that? It takes time. Now, a lot of you, you're like, if a person gets saved, you think they ought to be like Billy Graham within two weeks. Well, I got bad news for you. It took you longer than that. It's probably going to take them longer than that. Are there some people that it's miraculous? Well, if you were here last week, I hope you enjoyed that testimony that we had from the two people that just, it was just phenomenal. Go online and watch it if you didn't see it. Um, father and his son that were delivered from drugs, and it was instantaneous in their life. But you know what? For most people, that's not how it happens. And by the way, I know him. I have breakfast with him just about every Friday. And I know that he's not a finished product yet, even though he's a great preacher and has a great story. I know there are a lot of things he's still got to work on. We've talked about it. And you know what? It is a process that you must trust in the power of Jesus Christ. If you're going to change, you know what it's not about? It's not about your performance, but it is about the power of Jesus. And then finally, and I close, you got to learn the promises of Jesus to know the power, the person, and the process. You want to get to know Jesus better? You want to do better on the process? You want to know the power of God? You know what you got to add to your life? The promises. The promises. You know what he said there? He has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Now, let me ask you a question. What if, I know there have been a few times that the lottery got up over a billion dollars. Will it be? It's a lot of money. I hope some of you went and that you tithe. All right, that's all I'm saying. You say, are you going to win it? I would love to, but my wife keeps on telling me if I'm going to win it, I have to actually buy a ticket. I, I didn't know that's how it works. So, But look, the fact is they will make a promise to you. If you buy the winning lottery ticket, guess what happens? You get a promise. And they'll either give it to you and it's reduced, but a lump sum, or they'll pay you over 30 years. Now, what if you held the winning lottery ticket and with that ticket, everything financially, at least in your life, would change. Let me, let me just take a quick survey. How many of you, if you knew that you were promised $1 billion tomorrow, you'd take that promise? Let me see your hand. Anybody? Some of you are not raising your hand, all right? There is something wrong with you, all right? Here's my point. Do you know that for many of us, we've got these exceedingly great promises and we don't take advantage of them? God's promised that if we'll get to know him, it may not be instantaneous. And yes, you're still going to mess up. And yes, you're still going to need forgiveness. And yes, you're going to forget it sometimes. But he'll begin a process in you that will change everything. Not some things, everything. You know what he says? That when you become a follower of Jesus, here's what he does. You become a new creation. Brand new creation. Once again, we're not talking about a makeover. Oh my goodness, I've seen people get makeovers and I'm like, oh, they look good. But then two weeks after the makeover, they don't look good anymore. You know what I mean? Heard about one family that won one of these 
shows they do about when they get you a new house, you know. Um, they redo it very popular a few years ago, these uh, shows. And there was a family in Georgia that got that, had a completely brand new rebuilt house. And then about two or three years later, they lost it. Now, what happened? They didn't take the promises. Now, what God says is this. If you want to get to know Jesus, how do you do it? Well, you got to get to know him through prayer, reading scripture, meditating on his promises, worshiping, serving together on a team at church. In other words, doing life with Jesus. Not about following a list, but it's about getting to know him. The goal is not change. I want you to understand that. The goal is not change. You know what the goal is? Intimacy with Jesus. And if you'll approach it that way, guess what will happen in your life? You're going to have change that you won't believe. And you know what's going to happen? It's going to last. You don't have to say, I got to make a renewal. I got to renew my vow. I got to... No. You know why? Because God promised when you get to know him that you are a new creation. And the old is past and the new has come. Now, when Kim and I first started dating, you know what I didn't have? I didn't have a checklist. Spend so many hours on the phone. Spend so much time going out to eat. Spend so much time making out. No, I'm correct. I, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> that one, trust me, I didn't have, I have a list for. All right? I just did that naturally. But my point is this. Listen, you know what happened to me? Because I spent time with her, because I loved her, you know what I did? I spent time with her. I got to know her. I went out to eat with her. We did things together. Why? Because I began to have my focus, not on a list of things to do. I didn't have this list of things to change. Trust me, when we got married, it wasn't because I had a list that said, I will forsake all other women in the world. Now, I did that because I loved her. But before we started dating, that wasn't my goal. In fact, that was the opposite of my goal, <laughs> you know. But, but my point is this. You know why I changed? I got to know her. And because I got to know her, I fell in love with her. And because of that, guess what changed in my life? Only everything. Only everything. And the same is true with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, help us today to fall in love with Jesus. Help us to get to know him. Help us to believe that when we spend time with you, that you will change us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.